Harris, Norman from my father's name, and Gilbert was the brother of my mother, who was Olive Jones. I was born in Wangarei on the 19th of August, 1923, and we lived at a farm near Wangarei in an area called Wariora. It's on the corner of Adams Road and was traversed by Harris Road. And we lived there until 1929, I think, and uh, we lived on what was part of the, the block of land taken up by my maternal great-grandfather, John McKinnon. Now, last year, my mother, Olive, died almost 91 years of age. Uh, and um, because she told us a lot about her early life out there, a good, pa a good place to begin would seem to be with the McKinnon family. Uh, John McKinnon was a millwright, and he was born on the island of Ayr. I'm sorry, on the island of Arran, which was near Ayr, on the coast of Scotland and he was sent to Belfast to do a job, and there he took himself a wife, Jane McKinnon. Um, no doubt he had in mind a possible emigration to New Zealand when he took this step. Anyway, they came out and uh, they settled in um, in the Wangarei area where they had an offer of land. He was also offered work in uh, Dunedin, but uh, we're thankful that he didn't go that way. Um, their early life is documented in a little booklet called Prepared for the, uh, uh, the Centenary of Their Arrival in 1859, which was prepared by one of the sons, Charles McKinnon, and called from memory Thistle Downs and Shamrock Gowns, and gave a brief resume of their journey out, and also listed the, the children of that marriage. And my, my grandmother was a daughter of that marriage, and her name was Janet. The Jones family came into the area a little later on, and I believe it was uh, 1876, and they settled a little further out from Wangarei past our place in an area called Taheri. Uh, David Jones came out with an adult family from the island of Anglesey. And his uh, name is a clue to, the, to his origin. Um, one of his sons, Thomas Ernest Jones, who was my maternal grandfather, was a, I think, had trained as a painter and paper hanger. Uh, and in turn, he and his brother took up land even further out from Wangarei, um, which was, um, could be reached only by uh, by boat on the Harahara River or by, um, uh, by a saddle track. When uh, Grandma was five years old, uh, her grandfather, 
supervised and a father and brothers built a school at a location called Brunaven uh, alongside of a stream that had been named by uh, her father uh, and um, she was in the fortunate position of being able to school was ready for her to go to when she became uh, school age they were they were very isolated there um, they could the her grandparents' uh, place at uh, Tahiri was known as the depot, uh, and uh, various members of the family married uh, and generally settled in, in adjoining areas. Uh, and uh, everybody used to get together at Christmas time, and uh, they would uh, they would uh, travel from their farm up to the depot uh, on a, uh, a sledge with a special frame on it and uh, a mattress of hay strewn on it. Uh, and the kids would ride on that while uh, grandmother rode side saddle. Um, later on they uh, the road was improved slightly part way and uh, they got a gig and uh, they would leave that down near the Brunaven school and undercover there and uh, they would use that for their infrequent trips into Whangarei. They were pretty isolated and uh, um, there's no doubt that deaths occurred uh, because of their distance from uh, medical aid. Grandma tells the story of uh, she was helping a neighbour with milking uh, and uh, that's a chore that uh, at the end of milking you need uh, lots of hot water cleaning up and she had a, a very serious uh, scalding of her leg at the morning milking uh, and it was uh, quite late in the evening before she reached the uh, hospital in Wangarei. Uh, that's a journey that now takes 15-20 uh, minutes. Uh, but uh, in those days of course they just had to do the best that they could. Well, um, uh, there's a very interesting tape that we have that Grandma made that uh, covers lots of these uh, lots of these um, situations and some pretty little word pictures of the life she and her sisters uh, led down there. Um, moving on to uh, the First World War after the First World War and my father came to visit his parents who had meanwhile bought part of the original holding that the, the McKinnons had taken up uh, and he um, bought some land alongside of them and he went off down the Horahara River to buy some fence posts or maybe some heifers or something and uh, from that, uh, uh, he met mother and uh, they were married in 1920. And uh, they, uh, they worked very hard on that farm and, um, and they sold it, uh, as I said, I think in 1929, 1930. Anyway, to, uh, to talk for a moment about the Harrises. The, my grandfather George Toyne Harris um, was a bit of a hard fellow. He trained as a doctor at Guy's Hospital 
uh, and uh, either decided or was invited to uh, emigrate. And uh, in turn, he married a girl called Alice Tomlin, who has the very strong features which are reproduced in some members of the family. Tomlins came from Lincolnshire, and I don't know much about, else about them except that they settled in Waimati in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, George Toyne's father was Charles Butler Harris, and uh, he was unfortunate enough to lose money in speculation and managed to get a job in the church as rector of the parish of Skillgate in, in the west of England in a county whose name escapes me, but it was near the town of Wellington in Somerset. Um, Charles Butler, the photograph of Charles Butler that another had, had was uh, marked on the back, son of Admiral Harris, but I don't know anything about that, about that gentleman. Um, George Twain and Alice Tomlin's marriage certificate describes George Toyne as a surveyor at the age of 22. My father's birth certificate describes him as a grocer in Auckland. Um, I do know that they uh, they farmed near Tio Mutu on the road out to Kafia at a place called Te Rao Moa. And Dad was at school on the coronation of King Edward the Seventh. Um, we went with him up the road, and uh, he was able to recognise where the the farm had been. And I think when Mum took him up there a little earlier, they he met a, a girl up there that he actually been to school with, for the, the old T. Round Moore schoolhouse that was being used as a hay barn. And we also met the characters in the town of Porongia, which in those days was Alexandra. And uh, that was the head of navigation on the Waipa River. And uh, this old chap remembered Dad and his brothers at school there. Um, Dad uh, worked at various occupations, um, particularly as a shepherd down on the east coast of the North Island. Um, and uh, he and his brother left for the First World War from Gisborne, and uh, his brother Jim was killed in the war, and uh, his name's on the War Memorial there in Gisborne. Okay, um, life at Wariora, the farmers were still settlers one another. And they got groceries in bulk and these were stores. But after we got a car, which I think was a 1923 Dodge, we used to go to town every Saturday. Our favourite purchase was an apple which you could buy for one penny.
and uh, I can well remember where we used to park every Saturday. Quite, we could depend on getting our usual parking place, and now it's very difficult to get any parking at all in that area. Uh, one thing I remember is that, that the um, every Saturday at midday, the local borough council would. Uh, turn its horses out of the stables and I think put them out to grass over the balance of the weekend when they when the workers knocked off at midday on Saturday. But, um, in those days uh, we had no electricity and uh, the um, lady's mum had to do all sorts of chores like making her own bread, she used to make her own salt, even used to make jars for preserving jam and so on. In 1928, um, oh, before that, uh, in the uh, influenza epidemic, my dad's brother George was the victim of that epidemic and uh, after some years his son Mervyn Harris came to live with us and work on the farm and in 1928 Kingsford Smith after flying the Pacific uh, flew the Tasman Sea and the reliable old Southern Cross uh, and um, of course one of my early memories is um, of making models of uh, aeroplanes with three motors, all uh, supposed to represent the, uh, the Southern Cross. Our, our cousins, the Douglases, lived beyond the depot. In fact, they lived beyond the farm where Mum had been raised. Uh, and uh, some Sundays, we would go and visit them. And before we had the car, we'd go by the two horses in a wagonette. And we could only go so far in the wagonette, then they, they would unhitch the horses and I'd go in front of Mum and Jim would go in front of Dad and we'd have to ride the rest of the way. However, uh, by the time we had the car, the road was just passable. And I went to school at, uh, at Wariora. We had to walk uh, some distance from our farm across to the school which was held in the local hall. In my memory uh, Winter mornings were much colder then than they are now, and there was ice on every little puddle of water along the side of the road and across the paddocks where we had to go. Um, we used to have a, a school assembly with a, an old gramophone with playing um, Colonel Bogey and. Uh, the whole complement of the school. I suppose there'd have been about a dozen of us, um, ranging in ages from my five to uh, kids of 15. We'd all file in together. When they, when they sold the farm, um, of course the changeover comes in the, in the uh, in the middle of the school year, in time for the start of the dairying season, about halfway through the year. Uh, and we, we still went to Warrior School. The schoolmistress, Miss Pitney, who lived to a very ripe old age, and uh, we heard of it until comparatively recently, uh, used to pick us up and, uh, and take us out there for the rest of the 
of the of the year. And I can remember our, my first ride in a sedan motor car. Our old Dodge was being serviced and Dad came out to the school break-up service in a borrowed sedan. And it was a, a great leap forward in time almost. We rest now? Yeah, sure. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions? Right. Um, uh, the, uh, the offer that John McKinnon had to take up land, uh, was that part of an organized system of demigration? Yes. Incidentally, uh, uh, their McKinnon's arrival is also uh, documented in a recent book by uh, Nancy Pickmere on called Wangarei, The Founding Years. Um, it was a government scheme and uh, uh, the bigger the family, the more land you've got because each member had an entitlement which was... Well, do you have any idea of the size of that entitlement? No, not really. Was this homesteaded in the same way that North American land was homesteaded? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, in 1876, when they, well, I guess when the McKinnons took up their land, the markets were being uh, primarily domestic. Yes. Um, it was 1859, of course, when the McKinnons arrived. 1876, the Joneses came out. There was a, there were the remains of an orchard on on our farm, um, and that was in the vicinity of what I later discovered was the original position of the homestead, McKinnon homestead, which was destroyed by fire. Uh, but I, I think they milked a few cows and uh, and made butter from it, and uh, in turn, my grandma's parents did the same sort of thing. Uh, in the, I think at some stage they were able to get cream off to a factory. This is grandma's parents, but the original McKinnons had to make butter themselves and then carry it on their backs uh, into Wangarei to sell it there. Um, the house that we lived in uh, had quite an interesting history. Uh, Um, my grandmother was born in it, and mum was, I'm sorry, grandmother was married from it, mum was born in it, and she later returned to it as a bride. Uh, it's since been demolished. It's the Warriora home. This is the original Warriora home. Oh, I'm just thinking of some of the things about the farm. Uh, a little money spinner we had was was uh, catching baby rabbits, and, and ra rabbits were a real problem. Uh, and uh, we made uh, fantastic money, in our view, for for finding rabbit burrows and um, and. Um, and killing the little rabbits and uh, presenting them for, you know, to get our bonus on them. At the, the uh, when we were in town, we always used to like to go down to the, the wharf in Wangarei Town Basin, which is now silted up very badly, but at that time, uh, there used to be quite a few ships come up there. vessels that later traded to the uh, Chatham Islands, they, they were quite a size. But our favourite was the Claymore, which um, ran a pass an overnight passenger and cargo service to Auckland, and the local butter factory output would be loaded onto, onto that um, 
I don't know whether the hole was refrigerated, probably not, but they'd take it down to uh, centralised coal stores in Auckland and from there it could probably go overseas. Um, we used to uh, do quite a bit of eeling in the creeks around uh, around the farm, creeks which uh, seem to have shrunk uh, in recent years, well they've certainly been cleaned out of willows and, uh, and straightened up a bit, but probably quite a bit of, uh, quite a hazard when we were, we were small because parents both in the milking shed and the kids just had to be put in a box or something and uh, which doubled as a crib, um, and um, when we got to the stage of being able to crawl out, then uh, we caused all sorts of panic by falling into the creek. And uh, I understand on one occasion I went to uh, kindly feed a cow that had been separated from a calf, and. Uh, she didn't like the look of me and pinned me down with the horns. Fortunately, I have no direct recollection of it. Well, anyway, um, 1939 was the big year because freed of cars, my parents were able to make a, a trip southward um, and driving to Auckland was still uh, quite an experience in those days. Uh, there was in the vicinity of, of Waipu um, one of the first of the notional railways that they built. In other words, some politician would make a promise that Waipu in this case was going to be on the railway. Uh, then it wasn't. So to make good his promise, he'd arrange for a, the road to be tar sealed out there. Uh, this was in such a stark contrast to the rest of the road that uh, there was quite a history of people battling their way up through the centre section, getting onto this road and falling asleep. Um, we stayed uh, overnight in Only Hunger, I think, on our way to see Dad's parents who had the Royal Mail Hotel in Coromandel. Um, and it was our first Christmas away from the farm, our first Christmas under electric lights. And I remember that uh, we boys were playing in the yard of the hotel in a butter box uh, and I happened to be in command when uh, the box sheared into two pieces quite neatly um, and I was in real trouble with my grandmother. I think grandfather was too busy in the bar with his clientele to but I remember being confined to quarters, possibly Christmas Day. Anyway, that soured me of Coromandel for quite a while. Um, we went on then to stay with Uncle Charlie in Tikawiti. And uh, there I went a bit queer and uh, when they got to Hamilton, uh, it was discovered that I had double pneumonia, so I was left in the Waikato Hospital for about six weeks, I think. And uh, because Mum and Dad had to get back home, and uh, time was uh, approaching when. Uh, 
they had to take up their new farm at the Three Mile Bush, and Dad was busy working on the place in anticipation of this. Um, but I got back in time to spend a, a few weeks at um, Horahora School, which is celebrating its hundred and twenty fifth anniversary or hundred and fiftieth anniversary perhaps uh, I think this coming year uh, and then we we moved to uh, up to the three mile bush road uh, and uh, we had to go about a mile and a half each way to school I think uh, down what seemed a very hilly road to us at the time. Um, part of the time we went on a school bus and part of the time we rode ponies. The school still had a, um, a horse paddock attached to it uh, and um, the horses shared the grazing with uh, somebody's cow, I don't remember. I remember that I had, when I reached Kamo School, I hadn't learned to write longhand, I could print. And I had to teach myself to write. And I remember copying with great care each little irregularity that appeared in the, what the teacher had written on the board. But that nonsense was soon knocked out of us and we had to write copper plate in those days, so we learnt to write. And um, so we stayed at Como school, school until 1936. Your move to Three Mile Bush was in what year? 1930. 1930, yeah, about 39 years. Um, I remember 1932, uh, especially because I, I won a prize for schoolwork, and I remember the presentation. And I remember what seemed like dozens of aeroplanes flying northwards to some sort of air pageant. Uh, when we, um, the headmaster at, at um, Camo School was a, a real tough old bird, Polly Perkins. Polly Perkins had been a Herald delivery boy in Auckland and he'd been down getting ready for his paper run when he saw the sky lit up from the Mount Tarawera eruption, which was a, about the one thing in his life that, uh, that enthralled us. Oh, we did all the usual things. We played marbles and we played cricket with uh, pick handles. And we played football. And we had to walk all the way over to Glen Derby, which would be five miles perhaps, to play there. And But there were compensations. You could get a meat pie for threepence. I remember at Wilkinson's, the local bakery. Camo Hotel burnt down one night. We couldn't see the actual blaze, but we could certainly see the flames and the glow in the sky, and the old wooden building went up. That's now the local 
carbon ca camo. And uh, recently I saw uh, the local rugby hero, all black Ian Jones. It might well be a relation, I don't know. Uh, anyway, Ian Jones was proudly displaying New Zealand's most northerly traffic light. And that traffic light stood right alongside of the where the hitching rail was, where we used to tie our ponies when we went to school. Um, life was pretty interesting on the farm. Uh, it was interesting because uh, people were just hanging on to their farms by their fingernails if they were lucky. Uh, I remember we used to kill sheep and take some into the the lady who had the mortgage that helped keep her sweet. Um, I think we used to kill a few sheep and sell them off and we'd buy a quarter for half a crown. That would be one eighth of a pound. So that would be uh, 25 cents, wouldn't it? Something like that. So one week you'd get a four quarter and the next week you'd get a hind quarter. So every Saturday morning we had lots of nice fatty lambs fly <laughs> and hearts and things like that. Um, the farm was in a, in a, uh, half the farm was a, a volcanic origin and uh, there were scattered the volcanic boulders um, and some of them were as big as that table over there uh, and uh, there were no hay paddocks when we went there so they set to work to the ultimate was to get the paddock into condition that you could take hay off it and then it was uh, you could do that and of course it was uh, okay yeah well uh, these uh, boulders were cleared away laboriously uh, and um, hay paddocks prepared and the pastures uh, improved and, uh, and uh, lots of fertiliser put on. And a feature of that area was a number of uh, stone walls that had been made by gathering up the uh, stones that were lying loose. However, there were a lot of the larger stones too that had to be uh, drilled and uh, and shattered with uh, with explosives, uh, and uh, leave it onto uh, sledges and uh, and haul into dumps and and uh, windrows. The, the Three Mile Bush was a very attractive area. There was some nice stands of bush and uh, with the stone walls and so on. It looked very neat. It became a very popular area with the army uh, during the Second World War and then uh, when uh, there was a division centred on uh, on Wanneray and uh, uh, there were camps scattered all over the place. But uh, it was pretty hard work as you can imagine in, in those days. There wasn't much money about so uh, Rather than getting a tractor, my father bought a bullock team. And, uh, and we uh, uh, originally, uh, a bullock driver came and worked for us for a few months till mum and dad got the hang of driving these things. And uh, from then on, they, uh, they broke in uh, all their own uh, animals. 
as well as driving the team. Um, in later life I had the uh, good fortune to go on a uh, course in uh, transportation planning and traffic engineering in Sydney, the University of New South Wales, and it fell to my lot to make a speech at our farewell dinner. So I was uh, modest about uh, my scholastic attainment there, but there was one distinction that I felt that I could claim without challenge uh, then and uh, almost forever. I thought that, uh, and said publicly, that I was quite sure I was the only Bullockies offsider uh, that, was, that had been on that course or was ever likely to. So we, we, were, kept, uh, we were kept pretty busy. The, um, during the Depression, uh, the Bullock teams were used to uh, haul out uh, timber. There was a little market for mine props. Uh, these are balks of timber that were required to shore up the workings in the coal mines in, in Kano which ran under a large part of the township. And uh, we would go into the bush. We children would have to slash out the undergrowth, the supplejack and so on. And the tracks would be formed and the trees that they wanted would be cut out. And later on, uh, there was some very good uh, remove timber, which is a red pine, and uh, some kauri. Uh, these were dead uh, kauri trees, seasoned trees, that had to be cut up into uh, uh, with a pit saw, which was a horrible job. Um, brought back memories to mum, of course, of the building of the school at Brunaven because the timber from there was uh, cut on their farm and pits on and, uh, and used. When, the, when the, uh, the timber was cut into balks or flitches, as they called them, they had uh, cables across the gullies and they'd attach these balks of timber to the to the cableway and shoot them across the gully and uh, those that stayed on and uh, arrived there safely uh, were then hauled up by the by the bullocks and taken away and sawn up. Um, an interesting uh, um, arrangement that they had was a, a windlass that they called a whim. It was really a uh, a thick tree trunk uh, stood on end, a little bearing at the bottom of it, and a, a capstan bar attached to the top end, and then the bullock team was hitched under that, and they just went round and round unceasingly. And the area where this was situated was a clay area, and uh, I've never seen anything quite so sticky as that clay got as the, the Bullock team worked there. Uh, the logs were quite remote at times from where the team was working, so there was, they had all sorts of systems of communication from blowing on um, horns. from the previous bullocks themselves, I suppose, to uh, bells that they, that they rang or pieces of iron suspended that they clanged with another piece of iron, trying to set the signals down. And the roadways that the logs were skidded up uh, in many places uh, 
they had to use corduroy, that's to put timber across, short pieces of timber across them and the logs would be skidded up on those. And they were brought up out of the bush and, um, and uh, a lot of the handling was done with um, timber jacks. And uh, that was a sight to see these people who could use them properly uh, maneuvering these, uh, these logs around with these, uh, with these timber jacks. I don't know whether they were peculiar to New Zealand, but they were certainly a very effective tool. Uh, besides uh, working uh, the, the timber for the mine props and for the sawmills, there was some clear felling done too. That was an interesting undertaking. They had started, the, the, the bushmen had started at the bottom of the hillside and they'd go across and they'd cut every tree about halfway through. And, and they'd climb right up to the top of the... Doing this, they'd climb right up the slope and up to the top of the ridge. And there they'd, uh, they'd start uh, felling the top tree completely and that would fall on the next one down and the whole thing would go down like a, like a pack of cards that left a tremendous mess, uh, but the stuff was just left there to dry out until, uh, until autumn and then uh, they would set fire to it. I guess we were pretty lucky to see some of these things. They were, they were really a hangover from earlier days. Uh, and. Uh, probably was done this way because that's all we could afford to do. But um, the next job that the people helping us went on to, they invested in a motor hauler and uh, life was uh, a lot easier. Well, these uh, uh, bush burns were, as I say, they were a sight to see and uh, of course we can still see great clouds of smoke even today when some of this um, work's going on, uh, felling native bush to make way for pine plantations. Anyway, uh, they, we used to leave patches of, uh, of bush as uh, shade and shelter for the cattle. And I remember on one occasion seeing the flames get caught into the the green tops of these trees that have been left uh, with the wind behind them and uh, the fire just raced through the tops of these green trees. You wouldn't imagine it possible. Certainly a pretty awesome sight. Well, the bush burns, of course, were uh, immediately uh, uh, very fertile with the humus that had been built up in the soil and the ash from the fires themselves and they threw a bit of seed on it, a few turnips and the grass seed and, and away we went. But it uh, wasn't long before we youngsters were out with little bags of manure hanging on from stump to stump and uh, scattering uh, superphosphate to help keep the grass going along. Of course, these days, um, nobody would think of uh, clearing an area like that. But at that time, of course, the cry was produce and produce, and uh, even more so when, uh, when the war started. So much of the land they have now been put back into trees Yes, well, the marginal land that's never been cleared, is, and that's happened all around the world, isn't it? Well, in fact, of course, the, the property is now being subdivided and sold into lots. Tree lovers have bought some of it and uh, 
replanting it. Um, we had a, a pretty tough time during the Depression, of course, but uh, we gradually came out of that. I remember being in Wangarei. Uh, somehow we managed to keep the car on the road and registered. And an aeroplane flew over and dropping leaflets. And uh, the story was that somewhere amongst all the leaflets that was dropping, there was one that would win some fantastic sort of prize. Uh, and there was a swamp near where we were parked. And I made my way into that. And uh, when I came out, I took my muddy sandals off and left them on the running board of the car. And uh, I was without shoes for six months or so that we could afford some new ones. Um, 1936 I started the Formerae Boys High School. And uh, about that time, and we used to travel by train. But about that time there was a coal mine uh, being reopened just right next door to the uh, to the Como railway station. And uh, there was a little steam engine that, that hauled trucks up out of a, an inclined uh, drive that went down into the mine. And when it got to the top, the trucks were picked up and pulled by horse around and, uh, and dumped into the railway wagon. Well, over my time of <coughs> going to high school there, the mine made a bit of money and uh, they, their system of hauling and loading into the railway wagons got uh, improved a bit and finally the mine was taken over by the State Mines Department. and uh, worked for many years. Uh, now, unfortunately, there have been a lot of subsidence from the mine workings. Probably the old mine props from our place have outlived their usefulness and uh, can no longer offer any support. Um, and that's a problem that Wangarei shares uh, has to itself amongst uh, the cities of New Zealand. Um, I used to go um, up to walk down to uh, the railway station and we would catch a train which started in Hikarangi and it brought down coal and uh, some particular types of limestone which were bound for this cement works at Portland, just south of Wangarei. It had a carriage uh, that uh, was mainly used by boys and girls from Hikarangi. We were segregated. The boys had one half of the carriage and the girls had the other. Uh, roll lamp or lamp and hard wooden seats down each side of the, of the carriage. Uh, there was uh, an initiation ceremony and uh, we newcomers got thumped pretty hard. We had a longish walk again when we got off uh, in Wangarei to get to, get to the school uh, and it was a big handicap to have to leave at about two o'clock because the Oakwood Express that we've travelled home on left um, left one way at twelve minutes past two, I think. Anyway, in, in subsequent years, uh, 
some arrangements were made about bus passes that made it uh, feasible for us to go in by bus uh, and uh, we had to put in the four days we had to put in the four days work at school although with the uh, milking commitments and so on uh, we had to uh, didn't have much opportunity to take part in sports at school or any of the other after classroom activities. Uh, we were still without electricity on the farm at this time. I used to do lots of homework by, uh, by candlelight. Didn't seem to have affected my eyes much. Uh, well, I suppose I was in the fourth form, might have been fifth form when when we got electricity and uh, it was uh, lovely to be able to have electric light to work by. Until this time there, of course, the farm cowshed equipment was driven by a, an old one-cylinder petrol engine uh, that had the virtue of uh, being easy for the farmers to maintain themselves. Uh, it was made by a firm by the name of Anderson. Um, there's a little story about um, I was in hospital and I went to the bookshelf and there was a, a book with a picture of a battleship firing a broadside. And I thought, that looks interesting, I'll take that back and read it. And when I opened it, one word, I just opened it at random, and one word, stood out for me, and that word was Fargo. Well, the story was that um, Andersons, who made the petrol engine that drove most of the milking machines, um, was quite a successful business, and they were able to send one of the sons off as a cadet to, uh, to the Royal Navy. And uh, the picture on the cover was related to his experiences in the First World War. But what my page in Fargo was all about was that uh, when he left the Navy and joined the firm, he went on a, uh, a sales trip through North America and he made, made his way across through Fargo and, uh, and across Minnesota and Wisconsin. And uh, apparently he did quite a bit of business in the way of milking machines that were made in New Zealand. So that may be a little bit of interest in this part of the world. Anyway, we got electricity and we got rid of the one lung petrol engine and my father was rather daring in this. He was the only farmer on the road who dared put electric motors on his milking plant and separators and pumps and so on. And the power board was so grateful for his business that they gave him a free power pole. And we had an electric range and lights and some power points and, and that was it in the house. We used to have to heat the, oh, and we got an electric water heater in the shed. Prior to that, we had to uh, heat hot water by, uh, in, a, in an old uh, copper. And um, that's where we used to heat our bath water. We had, uh, funny old chip heater thing in the, in the bathroom, but uh, it was a bit dangerous and it was much more convenient to cut water down from the, from the cow shed to the house for baths. Um, the laundry was set in a separate building across the yard from the, um, from the house and uh, there was a, 
a toilet there with a honey bucket and it was the chore of us boys to deal with that as frequently as was required. We also had to bale water out of a tank that was filled from the roof of the house and we would carry it across to the laundry on Sunday for mother to do the washing on Monday. We'd have to fill the copper and we'd have to fill the tubs. And we thought this was a dreadful thing until a girl came who came from Openoni came and worked for mum, I think it was while she was having Clarice. And she watched what we were doing and she said, oh, I do wish my mother had things as convenient as this. So uh, you never know when you're well off, do you? Uh, we dug a number of wells on the, on the farm, but uh, it was very difficult to avoid uh, very rusty water. In fact, um, there was a product that we called uh, ironstone, which is, a, I suppose it was a sedimentary type of rock laid down from these springs, or from springs which were associated with these wells. And in the property next door to us, uh, there was a little industry going on there, quarrying this the stone from fairly shallow deposits, I suppose about a metre thick, and drying it out and then it was sent away to be ground up. And that was one of the sources of a trace element that was needed uh, down in the Bay of Plenty area and uh, Cambridge area and so on to combat the the bush sickness that affected the cattle down there. And I can't think of the stuff. Cobalt. Cobalt. The trash elements were found there on your farm. Yeah. Well, they were mined across the road from, oh. from our place. Yes, because from that time on they, they produced cobalt yeah. Well, this, this, this was a mineral for the limonite. Anyway, that's, um, water was water was uh, always a difficulty uh, there. And when we got flush toilets installed, uh, the pans very quickly uh, got stained with the iron in the water. Um, well, I had to milk cows the morning and night. Saturday afternoons we would go and play football and I remember it would come midday and we would be out towards the back of the farm somewhere and uh, we'd run half a mile and so in gum boots and then get changed and tear off to wherever we were playing football. Sundays uh, most Sundays we had to go ride to the back of the farm. It's a very broken area. And check out the dry stock that were out there, or sheep or whatever was there. And uh, in winter we would, uh, we would have to cut down um, any green bushy leaved trees that were available to uh, supplement the feed for the stock. Another job we had out the back was uh, clearing the fence lines of bracken fern. That was a pretty tough job too in places where you'd have to hang on with one hand to the fencing wire and use your slasher with the other to, to uh, keep the fence lines clear of uh, the fern in case of fire. 
but never a dull moment. In 1938, I was in the fifth form, and it was in those days we sat school certificate and matriculation, as it was, in the same year. And unfortunately, in August, I got. a very bad attack of pneumonia again and was admitted to taken to Long Ray Hospital by ambulance <coughs> and uh, put out in a side room uh, I don't know whether I was put out there to die or what quite what but I quite clearly remember what was referred to as the crisis and I quite realistically pictured myself as climbing very hard indeed to go up a flight of steps. Anyway, I made it to the top, whether that meant anything or not, and, uh, and got better. And not without uh, getting a whole lot of fluid on the lungs and having a hole punched into me. And uh, that was quite a quite an experience. I don't know how, what sort of uh, anaesthetic I was supposed to have had, but uh, it was certainly a very painful experience. Anyway, we got over that and uh, my friends who had come in to see me and, uh, and were, were so scared by the look of me uh, that they didn't come back. We joined them at school the following year, and uh, Julie passed school certificate and matriculation, and uh, and just in case anything else happened, I that year I um, elected to take the public service examination. So we got through, and. Uh, I was delighted to find that for the week that I was sitting these exams, I was given the milkings off. And that must be much appreciated. And I played football that season, and, but I always had a, 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 a shin pad sewn into my jersey over this empyema wound on my, on my back uh, and it seemed to work. Uh, Julie passed the exams, picked up a couple of school prizes that year and uh, applied to join the public service, applied to join the public works department. So on the 3rd of March in 1940, I started work at all places in the Land and Income Tax Department. Wellington was a, a big place, of course, to a country boy. And uh, there was lots going on on the wharves. There's still a lot of coastal shipping uh, and uh, quite a naval presence. Um, 
reinforcements going out for the New Zealand division and the minesweepers uh, doing their thing and uh, escort vessels of course coming in to pick up the troops. Um, this was after the fall of France and I remember seeing a little sloop called the Dumont Devil sailing in the, in the harbour. They must have been pretty amateurish because uh, the um, exchange of courtesies between one of the Royal Navy ships and the, uh, the Frenchman was quite hilarious. Things went well on the on the baby ship. Um, one of the cruisers um, possibly the Leander. Um, but uh, the the commotion on the deck when the, the Frenchman saw the salute from the British ship and people racing around trying to find the halyards to dip their own ends in. And uh, anyway, just one of those things. Uh, incidentally, the uh, interesting thing about the cruisers, those cruisers where they were fitted with a little, uh, wal what he was called a walrus, flying boat that they, I'm not sure whether they launched it from a catapult or, or just lowered it into the sea with a crane, whatever, they had to recover it that way anyhow. That gave them a bit of extra coverage in the, the pre-radar days. Um, I had the misfortune to meet up with a guy by the name of Leviston. Oh, uh, first of all, I was very disheartened in the uh, Land and Income Tax Department. And I remember being sat down at a mound of paper of blue coloured triplicates or quadruplicates of the, the Social security charges. We all had to pay one and six in the pound. Social social security charge, and that for fifty years gave us free medical treatment uh, and uh, and other benefits. Um, in the meantime, it got tied up with the general funding, and uh, we now find that. Uh, we weren't paying into a fund at all that we were just uh, paying our way as we went along, so they don't owe us anything. Anyway, um, I got fed up with, with that and, and uh, had the temerity to write to the Public Service Commissioner to tell him that I'd come to join the Public Works Department and uh, that I was planning to go home but you know, he couldn't uh, organise that for me. So I went into the Public Works Department as a clerical cadet. I met a chap by the name of Leviston who was a keen supporter of the Onslow football and, uh, and cricket clubs. And so I had a nice introduction from him and then he went off to the Pacific and then up to uh, up to Egypt and he was wounded in, the, in the, the back of his heels at uh, Alamein. We didn't dare ask him how he came to get wounded in that part of his body. In 1940 uh, they had the, an exhibition marking the centennial 
of the signing of the treaty in Whiting. And uh, that was, uh, to a country boy, that was really something too. But I have to say that during 1939, when they were preparing for the centennial celebrations, they were building a bridge over the railway line just out of Como, an overbridge. And uh, the, far, the uh, engineer in charge of that was staying at the Como Hotel and he drove a big yellow car. And I thought, if, engine, if that's what engineers do, that's, that'll do me. But I'd had an earlier influence when I was about five or six, I went to stay with the Douglases. And Uncle Bob Douglas had a contract to bring Queen up to Tahiri by a horse wagon. And there it was put on the mobile lorries and taken into Wangarei. Anyway, on the, there was some work going on on the road uh, that we passed over with the wagon. So he stopped to have lunch with the work team in their camp. And there we had the most delightful sausages and gravy. Uh, and uh, I <coughs> knew then and there that that was the sort of life for me. Um, when I was in Wellington, I studied at the uh, Wellington Technical College and, and uh, passed, did the subjects I needed to for my engineering preliminary exam, which if I'd had anybody to advise me, I could have done in my second year in the fifth form at, at high school. And uh, my salary was 78 pounds per annum. And I think we've got a boarding allowance of 32 pounds or something like that. I had to send home for my father's old overcoat when winter arrived in Wellington. And then I had to bludge another five pounds off them to buy my first suit. And five pounds did it. Uh, and then, oh, I had to get the fare. I went home at Christmas time and I had to get the fare from them for that. But come next Christmas, I was in the army because. Uh, I joined up again at the Wellington Tech to do the first uh, subjects for the uh, engineering and professional exams. And uh, I can still remember a little man with a pipe in his mouth who came out of the the little glass compartment that the two chiefs occupied there in the, in the, in the clerical department. And he said, some people have all the luck. You've been appointed to a cadetship in Tauron. So off to Tauron I went. And I think we'll call it a day at that. was very good, thank you. Running? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we've got to uh, Tauranga, but I just want to go back for a moment if I may. I want to refer to the time, 1938, when I had pneumonia, <coughs> and pay tribute to my mother's devotion to me while I was in hospital. She would have to walk a mile and a half, catch a bus into Whangarei, another bus up to the hospital 
and after visiting ours she would have to reverse the whole process and milk the cows and look after the kids and so on. So that's something I'm happy to place on record. Another thing that I wanted to mention when we lived at Moriora and we had a motor car and my father had horses and other people had motor cars and there were, during the winter there would be a huge patch of sticky clay on the corner by the house. So Dad had quite a, a chore, continuing chore, hauling motors out of this patch of mud that was there. So it wasn't, once you got a motor car, it wasn't all plain sailing by any manner of means. And uh, it'll become relevant later on, but <coughs> can mention that the headmaster at uh, Wangarei Boys High School uh, and my form master in the third form were both um, former members of the staff of New Plymouth Boys High School. And uh, in fact, they were the only two that whacked me in the, during my uh, school career. And uh, whacking in those days was uh, was no small matter. Uh, I, when I went to Tauranga, I went as a drafting cadet in what was then the Public Works Department, and. Uh, this would be about Easter in 1941 and uh, we were very busy because we were under orders to have lots of plans prepared for work to be done by the troops returning from the war which was supposed to be finishing soon. Uh, and um, one of the main, uh, main jobs was uh, the reconstruction of the highway between uh, Kati Kati and, uh, and Tauranga. It's something that didn't get done uh, completely for about 20 years as I recall. We also uh, uh, were involved in building a hospital at, uh, at Rotorua. They were building a permanent hospital in the government garden grounds and then they were told to leave that and start off building a, a new temporary building for rehabilitation of uh, wounded people coming back from the war. Uh, and uh, that temporary building uh, is now the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and uh, looks like continuing for some time yet. Uh, another uh, wartime effort was the establishment of a flying school for instructors uh, on the airport at, uh, at Tauranga. I had joined the uh, army in, uh, in Wellington when I was 17 in a, uh, a unit called a Defence Engineer Service Company which was really public works put into uniform. Uh, I can't remember that we did anything particularly useful. Uh, in fact the only thing I remember about it was following a, going on a parade following a, a tank that the Public Works Department had made for the Minister of Works, Bob Semple, made it from a D8 uh, Caterpillar bulldozer. Fortunately, I don't think it was ever called upon to do anything more than parading. So when I went to Tauranga, I was transferred to the Auckland East Coast Mounted Rifles. And uh, 
I felt uh, quite the military figure in uh, riding breeches and uh, and a felt hat with a four and a half crease in it. And we used to exercise up on the where the begonia gardens and rose gardens are now above Dive Crescent. Um, Tauranga was a, was a small office, but uh, we did lots of useful things, I think, in the drawing office. Um, I boarded initially with a Mrs. Rasmussen and more latterly with my aunt, dad's eldest sister, Annie Pickett. Now, um, I mentioned my great-grandfather, Charles Butler, the vicar of a place whose name I still can't remember, Skillgate, it was. Anyway, uh, Auntie Annie had her baptism certificate uh, hanging on the wall and it was performed, the ceremony was performed by her, her grandfather, Charles Butler. So, um, uh, he was more than a figure of imagination, he was a practicing priest. Um, in uh, October, I think it was, having reached the age of 18, I was called up for uh, three months training. We uh, assembled uh, in Tipuki, a party of us, and made our way over, and we lived on the race course in Rotorua. We lived in, uh, in tents and um, before we could get ourselves onto horses, um, the regiment was changed, the regiment was dismounted in fact and it became a light armoured fighting vehicle regiment and the emphasis for quite a while was on the light. Um, well, we did all, all the things that, uh, that recruits did, and um, if my memory serves me correct from my map reading, the elevation of Lake Rotorua is 927 feet, and that of Rotorua is, uh, Rotorua is 929, and Rotoiti is 927. So some good did come of that. We used to go uh, on leave across to Tauranga and it was like a different world over there. Rotorua at that time was a pretty shabby sort of area. Lots of rusty corrugated iron and uh, not a particularly pleasant uh, place. Um, on uh, December the 8th, being December 7th in uh, Hawaii, uh, we suddenly found ourselves at war with Japan and um, the first thing that we did in Rotorua was to mount machine guns on each end of the uh, Rotorua Airport, which was right in town, adjacent to the uh, to the race course. It's all built over now, and the airport's further out. Anyway, that's the way the war came to Rotorua. We eventually um, moved up 
to the camp at Narawahia and uh, the regiment mobilised there and uh, we were there uh, over Christmas I think and, and then moved on to, uh, to Pukekohe and uh, we, we moved up by train and uh, the train stopped at a convenient uh, place near the race course and uh, we all got off and clattered across to the to the grandstand and there were a few leaky bell tents in place um, and we uh, knocked the camp into shape a bit uh, but um, with the conditions that we were under, the, uh, we very soon had some serious influenza uh, outbreaks. I don't think they were confined to our camp either because they had to establish emergency hospitals on, uh, on the race course at Ellerslie. Um, and we had a a ward there with a very pleasant residual aroma of beer. Um, I was in the intelligence section there and and at um, and at Narrowway, so we had quite a good time cruising around all the roads in the district and uh, and. Uh, making notes of the condition they were in uh, against the day when uh, the regiment would become mobile, uh, mobile again. Uh, one thing that sticks in my mind about uh, Pukekohe was a, a, a walk down to um, Port Waikato now our, our colonel was a, a fellow who was sent back from the effort in Greece to uh, strengthen the war effort in New Zealand and uh, he was pretty cocky about his fitness. I remember him telling us to, that uh, we would have to be pretty smart to, uh, to keep up with him and so it was that when we we set off with uh, to this unaccustomed chore of walking uh, with full packs and blankets and rifles and ammunition. We'd gone a little way down the road when the, his, his car passed us and he hopped out at the head of the column with a swagger stick and uh, marched merrily along in front of us. quite interesting to see um, the way some guys stuck to the task there. I remember seeing some young officers with uh, who just wouldn't give up um, their feet were, and as a result were very very badly blistered. They had a truck coming along picking up stragglers but uh, it was interesting to see who gave up and who didn't. I had a very comfortable night when we got to uh, Port Waikato. I found a, a, an old uh, corrugated iron tank with the ends out of it, which somebody was using to dry onions in. So that was a nice aromatic shelter for the night. And I'd heard that there was a an engineer unit in camp in uh, in Tauranga, and I made some inquiries about that, and um, with an eye to the future, got uh, a transfer to the uh, to the unit down there, and 
step. It's a very significant move. Uh, when I got to uh, Tauranga, I remember calling on the, on my way through, calling on the boss man from the Public Works Department, and he was grizzling about, um, oh, all you young fellows, you, you know, you're all going off into the services, and you shouldn't be, you should be here helping us out, we've got so much to do, and he was probably right at that. But anyway, um, you can imagine my surprise on the next morning when I came out of my nine-man loose box um, it had uh, half doors in it uh, with, that the horses used to look over and we used to look over and we looked out and there measuring up the fairway was uh, the district engineer of public works department the man who was so busy and his highway overseer who was the club captain so he obviously had his uh, priorities right. Our main uh, task in, uh, in the unit at that time was constructing a, an anti-tank ditch from the Waimapu estuary right across to the Wairua River, just virtually across the base of the peninsula that, uh, that Tauranga was confined to them and, and also to the Hotamaito Bethlehem area. Uh, the reason for the anti-tank ditch was the, that um, Arapuni hydro scheme was such a critical part of the economy um, that there was some fear that there would be a seaborne raid. Um, and these fears were strengthened by sightings of Japanese submarines off the coast at, uh, at Mir Island. Anyway, for what it was worth, we toiled away um, with the aid of Public Works Department and uh, working parties from the local infantry battalion and from the the Home Guard, which by then was uh, getting well established, uh, and we um, we got this thing underway. Well, shortly after the uh, oh, about the time of the um, Coral Sea battle, uh, battle, I remember one day as we we set off for work uh, that. Uh, we were cautioned that if we heard any commotion that we were to get back to camp pretty smartly. And so um, there was some concern that uh, we might have visitors. Another um, thing that interested me was we, we didn't have much transport and we were work, walking home uh, one night. Uh, and back to camp and we passed uh, St. George's Church uh, which incidentally was uh, quite severely damaged by fire and at the time of our leaving for here uh, they hadn't quite decided whether they would replace the church completely or, or patch it. It was of course very much smaller then and uh, in the ports they had lithographs of the layout of the uh, of the position that was occupied by the Maoris in the Gate Power Battle uh, and also of the, uh, of the British lines and we thought we'd done pretty well that we'd, uh, we'd virtually retraced the position of the, the Brits, uh, Brits lines and uh, so we thought that, uh, you know, we were quite sound tactically on, on what we were doing. 
as I got older, I realised that all that happened was that the military mind stayed stagnant for 50, 60 years since, the, since that battle. Um, anyway, um, fortunately, of course, that um, it was never called upon to uh, to uh, to do the job that it uh, had been built for. And we also um, uh, I did some surveys up on the Como for um, road demolition. And uh, we eventually got on to uh, uh, preparing bridges for demolition as a, as a second line of uh, defence. By the time we were doing this, the whole exercise was becoming pretty, uh, pretty theoretical. Well, um, also about the time of the uh, Battle of Coral Sea, uh, I think it was at Easter time, we were allowed time off to go for a swim. The um, facilities in the camp were pretty poor. So we set off for the municipal baths, and uh, there I met Mum on her grey horse. And uh, that was probably the most significant thing about their stay in Tauranga. Anyway, um, I was working a lot in in the swamps, you know, with this um, um, anti-tank ditch and, and had some uh, bronchial uh, trouble. Which, which reminds me of what I intended to say when I talked about being in hospital in 1938. Um, I remember reading in the Reader's Digest about a, a year after that about this wonderful new drug, the sulfonilamides, I think, uh, that were going to put an end to uh, little problems like pneumonia. So, uh, bad timing there. Well, I had some more bronchial trouble and I was given leave from the army and uh, I was invited to stay with Jill's parents for a while and uh, I think by the time uh, I rejoined uh, the unit they moved across to, uh, to Matamata to work in that area and then eventually we were pulled back to uh, the unit's headquarters in uh, in Avondale camp on the race course there where we, we joined up with the other units which had been stationed in Wangaray and Auckland and in Hamilton. Um, we, our main activity um, became concerned with um, servicing uh, units in the way of uh, accommodation. Um, so uh, I became a corporal carpenter for a while. Uh, things got pretty tiresome and I volunteered for the fleet air arm, but uh, I failed on uh, failed on the uh, medical test, which was, uh, as it turned out, a jolly good thing because uh, those taps were pretty expendable. But um, our work took us into the north quite a bit, and for a while I was in in a camp at. Uh, on the Three Mile Bush Road, which enabled me to, to go home quite a bit. 
and uh, when the uh, Japanese threat had uh, receded quite a bit and uh, a lot of the units were, were stood down uh, and, uh, and people returned to, uh, to industry and to the farms and to, uh, of course, as, uh, into the third division which went up into the Pacific. Um, there was uh, quite a change needed in, uh, in in some of the camps that had been built uh, for uh, for tactical purposes. But some of these were no longer required, uh, and um, newer, bigger camps were required for the uh, for the consolidation, which resulted. Anyway, um, one of the units which was in this camp was the the, uh, the remnants of the North Auckland Mounted Rifles, whatever number light armoured fighting vehicle regiment they were. But by this time, of course, these regiments had been equipped with. Uh, General Stewart tanks, uh, and uh, they had more tanks than they had men, so they were tanks were being done up and, and sent back to ordnance depots. So, uh, to our delight, one morning we were asked if we'd ever had a ride in a tank, and uh, so we accepted the offer with, uh, with some glee. And uh, the tanks rolled up the road, um, past our place. This was uh, quite early in the morning, but the milkings had been done. Um, up past our farm, past the milking shed, up and uh, turned around to make a fast run on the downhill section. And uh, they picked up quite a pace. And I remember uh, being able to see as we rushed past our cream stand with two cans of cream in it. And I thought, by the way, that's really close to the road when you get uh, traffic rushing around like this. Of course, they were built close to the roads for the convenience of the truck drivers who had to pick up the cream. Well, these tanks wheeled into camp, roared into camp, and they wheeled into a line abreast formation and, and pulled up, and we got out, and I saw one of the funniest sights you could imagine. Uh, the driver of one of these tanks was pouring, pouring cream shoveling it out of his eyes um, and uh, the whole of the front of the tank was covered with cream. So I said to the young officer who hosted us, um, have you got any ammunition for these guns? And he said, why? And I said, well, if that's my old man's cream stand, to be honest, you're going to need it. But just at that moment, um, I looked across to the camp gates, and in through the gates came a, a cut-down Chrysler. Uh, the farmers used to cut down um, old Chrysler cars and, and put a tray on the back of them. And uh, our neighbour, Mel Young, had one of these. And on the front of it, he had a, um, a hay sweep uh, in the, in the um, travelling position. In other words, the, the tines of the sweep, were, which were about uh, eight feet long, I suppose, with, with steel shoes on the, on the sharpened end of them. He swung in through the, the, the gate, and uh, I fully expected 
expected to see him lower the sweep into the charge position and uh, and uh, retaliate for the action of the tank. But in, shortly afterwards, I had a summons from uh, the chap who was in charge of our detachment, and he said. Um, would I take Mr. Young round to our yard and uh, give him whatever timber he needed to replace his, his loss? And um, I'm quite sure that Mel Young didn't buy any timber for about three years after that. Um, when I was um, nearing 21, somebody said, uh, oh, you know, you should have, before you're 21, you should take out life insurance. So I got in touch with an AMP man and uh, was required to have a medical exam. And when the doctor finished the exam, he said to me, how would you feel about going overseas? And I said, well, yeah, I'd like that. And why? He said, well, I'm on the medical board, and uh, I think if you made an application, you'd uh, you'd be okay. And so I did. But these things move pretty slowly. Um, and uh, when I finally got away, it was in the the 15th reinforcement. And we did our training at, uh, at Papakura. From time to time I used to get called over to help out with pencil and paper on various chores. And one thing that struck me was that uh, I was called out one day and uh, they were going through the uh, recruits in the draft and uh, they would talk to them and ask them what corps they would like to be in and uh, and if there were any vacancies that's where they'd be they'd be uh, allocated to the artillery or engineers or wherever anyway um, a young snowy-headed fellow came through and his name was Sutcliffe and the two officers immediately sat upright are you the cricketer? Uh, and of course Bert Sutcliffe got where he wanted to go uh, on the strength of being a very good cricketer in fact of course he became uh, New Zealand's leading batsman uh, after the war. Uh, but the sad thing was that uh, we had a lot of third division chaps, chaps who'd come back from third division, had been manpowered out into industry and then called up again in the draft to go overseas and uh, uh, some of those chaps, particularly those who'd been in artillery and some of the more skilled occupations and they had to go in the infantry so they didn't think very much of. But the most uh, dramatic uh, moment was when I was helping out in the orderly room and the uh, command was count off 200 names or whatever it was and rule the line across. So I counted off 200 names and ruled the line across and the name below the line was John J. Stewart who'd, uh, he'd been called upon to lecture to the troops uh, on uh, some of the gases that are used in warfare. Although he was just a buck private like the rest of us. 
and um, we sailed from Wellington and called at Melbourne. I was fortunate enough that I didn't miss a meal, although the mess deck was pretty empty at times going across the Tasman. We had an escort, but I can't remember what it was now. It was a cruiser of some sort. And we called it Melbourne and then we called it Colombo. And we had a little run ashore at Colombo. Found it uh, very, very interesting. We anchored out in the stream and were taken ashore on uh, on barges, and um, while we were there, they were starting to erect decorations. And by the time we were into the Red Sea, a few days later, uh, peace had been declared in in Europe. We. Uh, anchored at Port Tufik at the southern end of the Suez Canal and we landed by um, barge, <coughs> fairly large barge and uh, I had an early attack of jippy tummy and uh, distinguished myself by having to heave my body outboard hanging on to the side rails in full view of the, the whole barge load. And we we travelled up by by train through um, uh, to Cairo and, and out to Mardi Camp. I remember our troop deck commander was Selwyn Toogood, the radio man and he'd been home on furlough and uh, he was going back for a second lot and uh, this, uh, Egypt, was, uh, Egypt was a very very interesting experience and uh, because uh, the uh, Japanese war was still going on and the uh, plans were afoot for a brigade of New Zealanders to be sent out there. We continued with our training in, um, in Māori. Uh, it, uh, it was in summer of course and, and we had to start very, very early in the morning with uh, Bailey Bridging. Bailey Bridging was a, a large part of our training uh, because by about 11 o'clock the steel was uh, so hot that it would burn your hands. And so we were supposed to have a, um, a siesta but um, you, may, you felt most comfortable if you were out uh, playing some sort of sport and lying down and sweating. We had quite a short stay in um, in Egypt. Or oh, we, yeah, we were going to have a short stay and go straight up to join up with the division in uh, in Italy. But um, when the news of the Japanese surrender came through, uh, things were. Things were upset a bit, and uh, they put a lot of emphasis on um, rehabilitation and, and uh, you know, the, the army education units came into their into their own, and we had the opportunity.